welcome. Well, you are at home with Jim and Joy, and you are an important part of our EWTN family. And we are delighted that you have welcomed us into your home. Now, we would love to hear from you, so send us an email with your question or comment to jimandjoy at EWTN.com. Well, today, we are very happy and honored to have with us Dr. Haywood Robinson. Now, Dr. Robinson was previously an abortionist who became a pro-life doctor, advocate, and worker. He is the director of medical affairs and education for 40 Days for Life, and he is the co-author of a fantastic book recounting his story, The Scalpel and the Soul, our radical transformation as a husband and wife abortion doctors. It's a great read. Mm. It's difficult to read, um, but it teaches you Jesus's extravagant mercy, his great grace, and it's truly a soul conversion. And therefore the grace of God yep. go I. And um, he's going to share and do such a beautiful job. And I'm looking forward to having him today and tomorrow with us. Yes. The Scalpel and the Soul, a radical transformation as husband and wife abortion doctors. Uh, we've had Dr. Haywood on some years back. Since that time, his precious wife, Noreen, has passed away. Mm -hmm. Some years back, he's remarried. We got to meet his new wife, Daphne. Absolute delight and totally mm -hmm. involved in the pro-life movement. Um, what, what a great story of their own love for each other. Uh, much here about the nature of Satan <laughs> and how he seduces us to have abortions, to become an abortion doctor. How does that happen to anyone? Same way it happens to us and other sins that we commit. But as you said, Joy, a great story of transformation, of redemption, uh, of that hound dog of heaven that continues to pursue God's people, even when they're not listening Christ is seeking to speak mm -hmm. and places people in our paths that we might hear the word of God and repent and believe in the holy gospel, mm -hmm. the gospel of life. Plenty more to come. We'll be right back. Don't go away. Welcome back. Well, we're very happy to have with us Dr. Haywood Robinson. He is a doctor who was previously an abortionist, and he became a pro-life doctor, an advocate, and a worker. He is the director of medical affairs and education for 40 Days for Life. He is the co-author of a great book that I encourage you all to read. It's called The Scalpel and the Soul, A Radical Transformation as husband and wife abortion doctors. And so he's going to tell his beautiful story. Um, and you might be home thinking, how could this happen? It happens. And what is the lure that Satan uses? Usually it's power, money, greed. Ain't nothing new under the sun. Well, we are delighted to have you with us. And um, you once were our banquet speaker one time and you yeah. did a great job and you got to share your testimony and the miracles that God has yes. done in your yes. life. Yes, so. it's a blessing to be here again. Thanks well, for having me. It's great to have you. Tell our family how you got involved in the abortion industry. Well, you mentioned earlier about how the evil one, how Satan gets you seduced into something. First, we have to recognize he's very patient incremental and it's done step by step in medicine we say you see one you know you do one and you teach one so you're in a setting of higher learning to learn how to take care of people's health however we know that abortion does not improve a woman's health but now abortion has been accepted as medical care and we know that's not true either but let's just say you're an aspiring intern 
at this hospital and you've got these esteemed faculty members and residents above you and they all believe that abortion is something that you do. So one day it's going to be abortion day and you get to go into this room and watch an abortion. So that's the first step. And I think your audience needs to know that the eyes are the window to the soul as it says in the Bible. So the first time you see an abortion is the first desensitizing or seductive step to make you closer to eventually down the road becoming an abortion. So you see one, and I will say that at the beginning, this didn't seem quite right. And then you see another one, it's not as bad. And the next thing you know, they're showing you how to do one. The next thing you know, you're showing someone else how to do it. The next thing you know, you're getting paid to do it. So there's a constant desensitization, but as you're going along in that process, one has to dehumanize that child that's inside that mother. It's no longer really a human being. It's really just a procedure that you're doing, and that's how the other side gets away with using terms like woman's reproductive right. Now, if you would have said 30, uh, 50 years ago, do you believe in a woman's reproductive right? We would have said, sure, I believe a woman ought to have the right to have a baby. <laughs> no, but what it means that we should believe that a woman has the right to kill her child. So in the midst of what we're talking about, abortion and a doctor's uh, involved in it, we've got to recognize, we've got to keep it simple and simply say we live in an era today where we kill our children, but we as believers and those that have been delivered from the, the darkness of abortion, that we just must stop killing our children. Mm -hmm. yes. But you shared so well in the book where um, when you were even performing abortions, you even dehumanized the client. So you never made eye contact with her. You never knew her name. You never asked her how she was feeling about the pregnancy. Um, you, so you just went in and it was just manual labor, a procedure to be done, cash to be had. That's right. Because if you make on contact with a person, what's, we talked about the eyes being the window to the soul. A woman does not naturally want to kill their child. They aren't created that way. When a woman becomes pregnant, a series and a multitude of physiological changes happen in their body for protection, for love. Most women want to keep their child and it's because of lots of circumstances, abandonment, being coerced into getting that abortion that really lead to that woman getting but what a woman wants is an opportunity to have their child and be supported. But as you read in the book, there's so many factors, the selfishness of a boyfriend, the uh, embarrassment, say if it's a, a pastor's daughter, can embarrass the, the family, and the child uh, is the one that pays the ultimate price and, and, and gets aborted. And yes, the, the woman's humanity is, is, is taken away because if you really looked into that woman's eyes, you would see they don't want to be there. And you wind up telling her, you know, we don't have to do this today. Mm -hmm. But you can't do that in an, an abortion facility because you're there to take care of that procedure. You have to recognize in that building you are there to sell abortions. You are there to take money to kill children. And you don't look at it at the time that way, but that's the bottom line of what's going on. You're a killing factory, you're there for the money, and if you subtracted the money variable out of this whole abortion equation, we wouldn't be sitting here mm -hmm. having this discussion right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. Desensitizing, dehumanization, and we're sharing these things because well, we just need to understand the psychology and the mystery of iniquity that's going on. And you know, when you know the demon's name, you have a better opportunity to cast it out. Um, so this is very spiritual and demonic, as well as medical and psychological. Because the whole thing of a human being 
is the greatness of being made in the image in the likeness of God, which means so many things, but to reflect his, his image, dehumanization, desensitizing, I mean, that's the call of Satan to do mm -hmm. that. And we've really bitten that apple. This is not to condemn those that we can condemn the act of abortion, but we don't want to condemn any human being, women that have had abortions, guys that have bailed out in terms of you know not really being there, uh, doctors like your, yourself, your former wife, your late wife. Um, and, and you really seem to understand the spiritual dynamic. Yeah, well it's all spiritual. I think we have to remember that Satan, who at one time was in heaven with a nice position, but he wanted a higher position of which God was not going to give him. And he was cast out of heaven along with one third of the demons, right? Or one third of the angels, which became demons. But we gotta also remember that Lucifer was in the presence of God. Lucifer actually saw the image of God. So he's cast down and he's in the Garden of Eden one day and he sees Adam and Eve. So for the first time since he was kicked out of heaven, he sees the image of God. How angry he must have been to go, oh no, this reminds me of the best days that I ever had. So that's why we're the enemy's public enemy number one. He hates the image of God. He hates God. We are God's prime creation. So that's why he wants to go after the human being and the most innocent, right? We're talking about preborn children and we know what Jesus felt about children. You know, he loved children. The, the disciples tried to stop children from coming to, to him and he rebuked his disciples. So. That's why abortion is the number one meal, the, the entree of the day for the devil mm. because he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And innocent blood is his most precious uh, target. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and you see where we are. Here we are in 2024. And, you know, Roe has been challenged. It's back out to the states. We know that the second that woman gets off that table, you would think the devil be done with her. Mm. Oh no. His job now is to come up and torment her for the rest of her living life. What have you done? What kind of a woman and wife or mother are you? Right? I mean, that, that's, that's his thing, is to torment you. And then in the creation of human beings, here mm. we are, he's trying to distort the face of God on every human being. I don't know if I'm a woman, I don't know if I'm a man. We have this whole gender mess where we, we seem to have lost our way, but it's all just demonic from the pit of hell because he doesn't have any other tricks and he's all about destroying us. Mm. And again, what you're talking about is what we mentioned earlier. But when we talk about this uh, you know, sexual dysmorphism or gender dysmorphism, you know, we are made in God's image, but he makes us, and the Bible clearly says he makes us male and female. The Bible also says that he's got all of these things predestined, mm -hmm. you know, before we were in our mother's womb to do. So it's demonic, yes, because what happens somewhere along the way, the enemy is successful in telling you, no, God's plan for you to be born as a male to become a young man, and then a man that marries a woman and then has children, that's not God's plan for you. You're, I have a plan for you, and we're gonna just make it up as you go. You might have to have a little surgery, change your body around. You might have to say you're not male, you're not female, you're somewhere in between, but it's all about attacking the image mm -hmm. and the order of how God mm -hmm. created you to be and what your destination to be on his behalf on this planet. Mm -hmm. The natural law, even before um, the church, yeah. the natural created order that is written upon our own hearts. Right. We, we all still have that. And here's the demonic, here's these culture, culture of death and a throwaway culture and distortion culture. 
what began to lead you out of this, you and your uh, precious wife at that time, Noreen? Well, it, it, it's interesting. One day I went to this evening, this Christian music concert in a local church, Leon Patello, and I went with my mother because my wife, my late wife, was pretty much close to term with our youngest child. And during the intermission of that concert, Leon said, those people that want things to be 100% right with God to stand up. Now, I was raised in the church, but I was not a believer. And I remind people that being raised in or attending church does not make you a believer no more than if you sleep in the garage, you become a car. <laughs> so I believed in God, but I was not a follower of Christ. Well, he, Leon Patello said, for those people that want things to be 100% right with God. So I thought, well, what, who, who could argue mm -hmm. with that? Mm -hmm. So he said, for those people who want that to stand up, and I know now, within a half a second, I'm standing up there, oh my goodness. And I'm kind of embarrassed because I didn't want, wouldn't want to stand up and not know there are other people who are gonna be standing up mm -hmm. also. And he prayed. Uh, what would be a, a sinner's prayer, but because I didn't know the basic fundamentals of Christianity, I didn't know what was going on. But after that concert, I took my mother home and I returned to my home uh, when Noreen was there with her feet up. You know, we were still two or three weeks before the delivery, but I knew, I knew something supernatural <coughs> had happened and over a period of the next two to three weeks, it turned out the godfather for that child was coming to town and he was the son of a Pentecostal <coughs> preacher. And he started crying when I was sharing that story because he and his wife had been praying mm -hmm. for um, uh, Noreen and I to come to a saving knowledge of Christ. And that was, that's how it worked out. Started at a concert and God just took the steps to open our eyes to that. Now, I, I make clear when I share my testimony, long before I knew what an abortion was, I was a sinner and on my way to, to hell. Mm -hmm. It just turns out abortion was just something else that the enemy had to or wanted to add to my life and mm -hmm. I bought into that. Mm -hmm. But God used that experience and that work to be where he wanted to place us which was which pro-life work, which indeed has been very yeah. fulfilling yeah. and, and my, my But before life. that experience, you had a friend who you went to lunch with who had said to you, <laughs> hey, you're gonna become a Christian speaker. Yes. And you were just kind of like, what? Like he just yeah. like dropped that in on you. Joe, let's pause at this point because <clears throat> we gotta go to a break. We're gonna hold you over for the final segment. Okay. We can pick this story up okay. or yeah. any direction you wanna go. It's the scalpel and the soul our radical transformation as husband and wife, abortion doctors, EWTNRC.com. We'll be right back, plenty more to come. Please don't go away. Welcome back. Well, before we went to break, you were sharing about how you went to that Leon Patillo concert and you stood up because you wanted to be 100% with God. So, it's <laughs> Whatever just, that meant. Right, that. right? I mean, who doesn't want to be 100% with God? Why not? God? Can't lose. Is it the God made nine my own image? <laughs> I want to be 100% with that. But before that incident happened, you had a friend who you went to lunch with and he just kind of planted a seed. God used him to plant a seed. Tell our family what he said to you and your response to it. Well, months before that concert that he invited me to, and that's Terry Takel, who at the time was pastor of a, a local church, Aldersgate. And uh, he took my wife and I, my late wife, to, to lunch. And I can tell he was rather agitated. And he says, you know, I've got to tell you something, Haywood. You're going to become a Christian leader in this community. And uh, that's pretty much all he said, maybe had a little postscript. And it's a good thing that I didn't have something in my mouth <laughs> or about to swallow. Yeah. 
I tell you, I just, well, I was gracefully accepted that and we had lunch. And I remember walking back to the car after lunch and I said to Noreen, who is this guy telling me I'm going to be a Christian leader in this community? And Noreen just kind of looked and she said, you know, he is a little different. And that was, uh, that's why I believe in the gift of prophecy because I even experienced it mm -hmm. as a non-believer, how God gives a word to a man and the man delivers that word to a group of people or an individual and the creative power of that word from God actually became truth and became flesh. So it was just awesome to see that, go to that concert, but then see the continuum how God works how I used my roommate from medical school, the son of a Pentecostal preacher, Calvin Wheeler, uh, who's a, a pediatric neurologist, how God uses, how he has this massive, massive chessboard and he controls every single piece to his glory and how his grace is so abundant. And just as a, as a sidebar, we just had a recent meeting with 40 Days for Life, our large annual symposium where Sean Carney, yeah. my boss and, mm -hmm. and CEO, said something that really captured me. He says, we as believers have to be greedy with God's grace. He just how exceedingly abundantly beyond all we can imagine he uses his mm -hmm. glory and his power. Mm -hmm. And I see that retrospectively now, mm -hmm. how he takes a sinner, someone who of course doesn't deserve all of the things that I've received at this point, but how he wants us to be greedy with everything that he has because he is so abundant and so Dr. graceful. Dr. Robinson, thanks for being with us. Thank God we have tomorrow to unpack this story of transformation more fully. So take hold of the grace mm -hmm. of God even now. You're an important part of this EW10 family. You're never alone and you're always at home with Jim and Joy. Bye now.